Galatians chapter 1, that's where we'll be, Galatians 1. I said, my wife's always correcting me, I said Susanna, and it should have been Rosanna. I knew there was an Anna in there somewhere. Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to uh, pick up sort of where we left off last week about what Paul said concerning the difference that was in him. Um, Galatians 1.15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, and then in verse 16, this, I want you to underline this, to reveal His Son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So the question of salvation, uh, let's, go to, we, let's go to John 15 because there's something I want to add to what I said last week about that. John chapter 15, when it comes to salvation and religion, it's easy to have a religion. It's easy to follow religion. It's easy for someone to say, well, I'm a Christian or I'm a Buddhist or I'm a Catholic or I'm an atheist. Atheism is a religion because it expels God and believes that man is his own God. That's what humanism and atheism is. It is it's a religious idea that just kicks God out and makes man God, which that religion was started in Genesis 3.15, or Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent told Eve that if she ate of the fruit, that she could be as gods, knowing good and evil. So it elevates, even humanism elevates man to the position of God. People can attend church, they can sit in church, they can be members of a church, they can be clergy in a church, and follow a church's teaching all their life, and never be saved, never be born again, and never, never have the promise of eternal life. People can do that. People do that all the time. I've seen it happen in my lifetime. I've been in this church. They were asking me, how, long, how old is this church? Said, well, they built the building in 1974. That was about when Melissa and I started coming here. And we've seen a lot of people flush in and flush out. We've seen people come in, say they were saved or say that they were different and followed and then gone. We've seen people our age that grew up in church that never survived it afterward, never darkened the door of a church again in their life. Some of them still alive, some of them have died. So what is the difference then between someone who follows a religion and someone who is the inheritor of everlasting life because at the bottom of everything that we're doing and believing is the idea that we have an eternity to spend somewhere do we not that eternity is determined by who lives inside of you if it's Christ you're saved if it's anything else like an idol in your heart or anything else then you're not saved and you're gonna spend eternity in the lake of fire so John chapter 15, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to use it to build into where I'm going next. John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now verse 3, now you are clean through what? The word. That which I have spoken unto you. So I want you to get this concept because he's going to say it again here in a minute. When you have Christ living in you, you will always have his word abiding in you. If you do not have his word abiding in you, you do not have Jesus abiding in you because Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. Can I get somebody to say amen? Okay, those two are not, you cannot exclude one from the other. If you say, well, I believe in God, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, 
um, but you do not have the word abiding in you, then you are not truly born again. So he says, now you're clean through the word. Uh, Ephesians 5, when Paul is teaching about the bride and the bridegroom, Christ and his church, Paul said that he washes the church with the water of what? Baptism? The Jordan River? The big river? The word. He washes them clean with the water by his word. Now you're clean through the words which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. Get that concept too. He's living in you. But then you are living in him. How is that? Can somebody explain how you are living in Christ or abiding in Christ or you are inside Christ somehow, some way? Who can give me a verse or an illustration of that? Anybody, anybody? Yes, Gary. That's not bad. Quotes whole scriptures. I like it. Okay. I am crucified with Christ. Okay. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Okay. Who can give me another one? An example or a verse or something about you being in Christ. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Going once, going twice. Go to... Um, Go to Romans. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. Yeah, I like this. Romans chapter 8, and there's another verse I'm thinking of, and I can't place it right now, but Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where? In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now I want you to think of, think of this as you're looking at Romans 8. I want you to think of something. When he says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. How do we know what the spirit wants? How do we know what the spirit desires? How do we know where the spirit is going to lead? It's actually real simple. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Some people's version of following the spirit means following their feelings or their emotions. I have learned that I don't trust my feelings or my emotions. And you shouldn't trust my feelings or my emotions and you shouldn't trust your own feelings or emotions but some people that's to them that's the spirit oh i just i ignore everything and i just follow some sort of emotional thing that's going on in them and it's going to cause them great harm they're going to make huge mistakes they're following after their own heart but not after god so when you say that you're going to follow the spirit of god you're following the Word of God because the Word of God and the Spirit never contradict each other. One never does something opposite the other. It's just like Jesus and the Word. It's the Spirit and the Word. So you look at chapter 8 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you can put in there the Word of God. Notice that he mentions the law of the Spirit. Verse 2, where's the law? The law is written in the book. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Look at your Bible. You have two testaments. One is the law of sin and death. It's the Old Testament. Because the law of sin and death said, if you break a commandment, you have to suffer the death penalty for it. Breaking one commandment. 
Break the law, you break the whole of the law. So the law of sin and death is the Old Testament, which condemns us. What then would be the law of, sp of the spirit of life? I hear crickets chirping. What's the law of the spirit of life? The new, the new covenant. The New Testament. It's a, and I'm going to preach this this morning. Some will say you got to follow the law in order to be saved. Who follows the law? Nobody. I haven't. My sister hasn't. And if you want me, I can tell you things my sister's done. No, you won't. I didn't follow the law. She hasn't followed the law. Our mom didn't follow the law. Nobody has. So God gave us a new law with a new covenant, with a new mediator, with, in a new testament written in written form. In written form. And that's important. I believe in following what the word says, not what my emotions tell me to do. And I don't know about you, but there are times when I struggle with my feelings. And I've learned that my feelings will lie to me almost every time. Every time. My feelings, my emotions, my urges, my instincts, they'll, tell, they'll lie to you every time. When I have feelings, I go to the Word and often the word will contradict how I feel and I'll have to, I'll have to literally say, God, I'm going to follow and believe what this says and I'm not going to believe me. Amen? So, um, here's, here's the point I'm making. Ba back in verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I want to give you a story out of the Bible where there was condemnation. It's called the flood. In the flood, God condemned this world. He condemned man. He even condemned all of the animals because in Genesis 6, it tells us that all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but something happened in this world to where here's God in Genesis 1 looking at his creation saying it's very good. And then in Genesis 6 he's looking at it saying it's very corrupt. And he's going to destroy it. But was God going to destroy everything? The answer is no. He saved a genetic sample of the species. And then he saved Noah and his family. How did he save Noah and his family? Did he teach them to swim? He did not teach them to swim. You can't swim a year. And that's how long they were on the ark. You can't swim. The, the waters, we know it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but we also know that the waters were pushing upward for 150 days. That's five months. Can you swim for five months? Can you tread water for five months? No. So God, again, did not teach Noah and his family how to swim. He did not throw them life rings. He told him to build an ark. And this ark was Christ. This ark was their salvation. And instead of Noah and his family hanging on the outside of the ark, hoping that they held on long enough to survive, where were they? In the ark. The ark is Christ. So you look at Romans 8 again, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. When you are in the ark, you are in Christ Jesus. And there is not a chance in the world that that ark is going to fail. Not a chance. It's not you that survived it was Christ and you being in Christ that's how you survive can I hear God's people say amen, amen. 
You want to know how to get through? Get in the ark. The ark is Christ. Christ is the word. So what am I telling you? Get in the word. Because that's your only salvation. That's the only way you're going to make it. So back to John 15. Um, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and then he says it again, my words abide in you. If you're in the ark, and then while you're in the ark, the word of God is abiding in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You know, there was for years... I could never teach on that verse because I didn't understand it. I, want, I knew what the Charismatics and Pentecostals and all these word faith people, I knew the claims they were making that if you just ask God to be rich, you have to be rich. If you ask God to get away all your diseases, then you have to be completely healed. And if you're not rich and you're not healed, then it's because you're not asking God right or you don't have the right faith or you're not saying the words right, or your eyes are closed when they should be open, or they're open when they should be closed, or any number of things that it's your fault why God isn't blessing you. And I did not really understand this verse till God taught me about prayer. God taught me about asking God for things that I had to have. Asking God for blessing or asking God for life or asking God for salvation or asking God for protection or asking God for any number of things. And the thing is, if you will be in the word of God and know what this book says, did you know that you will ask the right things? When you ask according, I got to tell you this story. We had a, a, a couple that um, they contacted me and they asked me to come talk to them about salvation. So I did. And I prayed with them in their home and baptized them here on a Sunday night. And when I, the night I baptized them, I found out they had a family member. I think it was the wife, her sister and her sister's husband was going to one of these word faith churches. And they came to the baptism. And as soon as I met them, I'm going, this is trouble. Because I, I, I sensed something about them. So lo and behold, they gave this new couple a Bible. But it was a spirit-filled life application Bible. And what that is, it has Bible in it. But on every page are charismatic doctrine uh, comments and one night the ladies of the church were gathered together for a Bible study and I got a phone call uh, brother Mike you can you help us with something because so-and-so's Bible has a comment and it says do not ever say to God if it be thy will do not ever pray that to God that's dangerous to pray that that's faith killing if you pray that, God won't answer your prayer. You just destroyed all your prayers. If it be thy will. But I mean, the hackles got up on me. And I, I, I said, shut it down. Shut the prayer meeting down. Because I wasn't there. But there was that influence going on inside that women's prayer group of that kind of doctrine telling these people that they're not supposed to say to God, if it be thy will, because you just, you have to proclaim to God what it is you demand. You have to stomp your foot and put your foot down and say, God, this is how it's going to be. And then God has to do that. And if you don't do it that way, you're not going to get anything out of God. And it's a lie. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And if it's good enough for the Son of God, it's good enough for those who are sons of God. Somebody say amen. So here's what it is. If you will follow this book, if you'll read this Bible, I guarantee you, your, your prayers are going to be absolutely in line with God's will. 
You won't be asking God for a brand new car or 20 cars. You don't care. Those are not important to you. What's important to you is your life, your family, your marriage, people's salvation, people, people being healed, people being helped. That's what's important to you. So anyway, it's about when Jesus abides in you, his word abides in you. Turn to Psalm 119. See, I said all that to get to this one verse. Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. If you've never read Psalm 119, I dare you. Psalm 119 is 180, 100, yeah, 176 verses of nothing but God's word being right 100% of the time. If you are ever in doubt of what God said, and I've been there, I've been there, I've, I've literally said, I'm not sure if this book is right or not. And my wife was sitting next to me saying, you know it is. She should have slapped me, but anyway. And I knew it was. But I was troubled. I was troubled in my spirit. And trouble like that happens from time to time. And you go back to the word of God and you say, God, you're not a liar. And I need your help. So Psalm 119, if I, I just encourage you on the days when your faith is low, read Psalm 119. Uh, verse 11 is what I want to get to, but I want to start in verse 1. Move down to verse 11. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. That's The law of the Lord is his written word. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. That's his written word and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do, iniqu do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. His ways is the written word. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. His precepts are the written word. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Again, the written word of God. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. His commandments are the written word of God. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. Thy judgments are the written word of God. I will keep thy statutes. Again, the Bible. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. How is it when we're young and stupid and do stupid things that God brings us out of that? And the older we get, the smarter and wiser we get. How does, how does that happen? And we don't do that stuff anymore. How does that happen? God's word in us. God's word corrects us. It builds us. It chastises us. It, it encourages us. It, it makes us what we are. Verse 11, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. And then verse 11, thy word. Say this out loud with me. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word. When Jesus is in you, his word is in you. Because what will happen, you'll be in a situation and you'll not know what to say, what to do, what's going on. And the Holy Ghost will quote scripture for you. Boom. Boom. I had scripture in a dream last night. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what it was or what it was about. It was weird, but I had scripture in a dream last night. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I was blessing. But when Christ is in you, his word is always in you. Okay? There will be a test on this. You need to remember this. It won't be me administering the test. It'll be God who does it. Turn to Colossians. I'm going to have you turn, turn, turn. Yeah. Colossians chapter 1. Turn there. So if you meet somebody, like in life, or you meet them on Facebook or whatever, you meet somebody... And they say they're a Christian, but they don't like the Bible. 
What does that tell you? They need to get right with God, don't they? Because there's a lot of them out there. A lot of them. In various degrees who will say, I'm just as good a Christian as everybody else is. I just think the Bible was written by men. Well, technically they're right. Jeremiah wrote the words down. But the words did not originate from Jeremiah. The words came from God himself. So it's God's word. Colossians chapter 1. Um, look at verse, let's back up a little bit. Look at verse... Uh, 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, you might want to underline that passage. Continue in the faith. The faith of what? Faith of God's word. Continue in that. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel is the word. It's written. Which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. There it is. Underline that to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. If Christ is in you, his word is in you. If his word is in you, his spirit is in you. And you are clean, you are whole, you are sanctified. You are purified. There is no defilement in you whatsoever. Now, in the old man, which is still alive, there is. But not the new man, the inner man that's in you. So it's called, and we're going to go through these, it's called various terms in the Bible. The inner man is one of them. The new man New man, new man, new man, inward man, inward man, inward man, born of God, born of God, born of God, uh, the hidden man, even women have in them the inward man, the hidden man, the new man. So turn to Ephesians chapter 3. You're in Colossians, so go back a couple pages, Ephesians chapter 3. I mentioned to you uh, Brady and Bradley's dad, Keith, who once he was saved, he didn't live long on this earth. He was saved 15 minutes before the doctor came in, told him he was going to die of cancer. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I will never forget that day as long as I live. Brady and Bradley called me over to the hospital. They're dead, taking their dad to the ER. He was having trouble swallowing. And uh, just some things going on. He's very sick. And so I met them. We were in the ER. They'd run some tests. And they were going to admit him to a room. When they got to the room, I told Brady and Bradley, I said, you guys go get something to eat. Let me talk to your dad one-on-one. -on -one. And so they said, okay, and they understood what was going to happen. And you know how, you know, when you, if you've ever gone to the hospital, the first moment you go into a room, how alone are you? There's nurses coming in nonstop. God worked it out so that when the boys went and left and I was in that room with Keith, there wasn't anybody bothered us for 30 minutes. And it only took like 15 minutes. But I went, through the very, I went through the simplicity of the gospel with that man. And I said, Keith, I don't know what's happening here. But I think you and I both fear the worst. And I said, I think you need to have Jesus save you before you die. 
And he said, you're right. I'm going, well, this is easy. The Holy Ghost had already set this whole thing up. And I led that man to Jesus. And I said, Keith, do you feel like if you died today, where would you go? He said, I believe I'd go to heaven. Doctor comes in 10 minutes later, says, you're going to die of cancer. There's nothing we can do about it. But he told, two days later, he gets out of the hospital. They're going over to the drugstore to get his medicine. And they're waiting on the medicine. He looked at his sons and he said, boys, I feel like I got somebody living inside of me. And he knew it. He didn't need to be a theologian. He didn't need to know all the verses of the Bible like I'm going to share with you. He did not have, he knew that there was something new in him that he had never had before. And Keith was a good guy. He was a good guy. But he was lost. And he needed Jesus. And I would rather have somebody angry at me that I had to tell them, you're not right with God and you're in danger of hell fire. I'd rather them be mad at me that I said that to them than for them on judgment day to look at me and say, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? So, people need to be told, amen? Ephesians 3, verse 16 Uh, let's back, let's back up a little bit. Um, verse 14, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where in the inner man. So underline that in your Bible, the inner man. That's what was born again that's what will remain when your flesh dies that it's the inner man where the spirit dwells where the word dwells the inner man is what's going to leave this earth and spend eternity in heaven that's your salvation right there the inner man not this flesh and not what this flesh does or doesn't do the flesh is already condemned. Already is. And it's waiting judgment. And the judgment is, it's going to be, it's going to rot in a grave and then God's going to burn everything up. Don't plan on carrying, if you're, if you're having the best hair day in the world, don't plan on taking it to heaven with you. Because it ain't going. Amen? It's the inner man. That Christ, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, not works. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Knowledge is the outer man, what our brain thinks, what your emotions might tell you. Be honest. Who in here has ever thought God is too angry with me to forgive me and I have no chance whatsoever going to heaven? Who's ever thought that? What's wrong with the rest of you? I have thought that. See, the love of Christ passes knowledge. Because when God forgives you of something, that nobody else would have forgiven you of. You have a hard time understanding that kind of love. A hard time. Amen? But when God forgives you, when nobody else will, nobody else should, when you can't even forgive yourself, when God forgives you, that's because His Son is in you and God remember this God doesn't condemn his only begotten son he doesn't to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God you know I talk about God the Father a lot I don't know that I talk about the love of Christ enough God sent his son to die for us 
but his son was not unwilling in that. He wasn't just obeying his father. He was doing it out of love for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Um, turn to Ephesians 2. This is, uh, Ephesians 3 was the inner man. Ephesians 2 is the new man. Think of it like this. Old covenant, Genesis through Malachi, applies to the outer man, the old man. It's the old covenant for the old man. And the old covenant has already been broken because you broke that covenant. You violated God's word. God said, don't commit adultery. You committed adultery. God said, don't steal. You stole. God said, don't even covet. And you coveted. So the outer old man is already condemned by the old covenant. But now there is a difference, a different set of commandments, a different covenant, different contract, and a different man. Understand that, because that's salvation. The old man is dead. It's over with, along with the old covenant. You cannot have a covenant with a dead man. Right? What happens if somebody, if somebody fills out a life insurance contract for a million dollars, pays the first premium, gets hit by a train, and dies? They don't have to pay anymore. Right? They don't have to pay anymore. The insurance company's going to lose a million bucks. But they don't have to pay anymore because you cannot have a contract with a dead man. And that's the purpose of the new man, new covenant. Let me read this and I'll let you go. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know what? I'm going to deal with this next Sunday because there's a neat thing in here. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And he's talking about the Old Testament. He's abolished it. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. There's a ton of stuff there. But let me give you the, the simple gist of it. Because... Christ lives in you and abides in you. God will not and cannot condemn his only begotten son. God didn't wreck the ark. He didn't sink the ark. He did not dismantle the ark. He did not destroy the ark. The ark remained intact. And is somewhere up around Mount Ararat, somewhere. I hope they find it. Amen. Hope they find it. But the ark never wrecked, never sank, never crashed. God condemned the world. And think of it. I've used this illustration before. What God used to destroy the world, he saved Noah with. Water. It was the water that lifted up the ark that destroyed. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Did Noah have to go and round up the animals? They came to the ark. God put it in them. They came to the ark. So did you. You came to the ark. Amen. Father, we love you. We have a lot to take in, a lot to be thankful for. And I pray, dear God, Lord, I just perceive, Father, that you're speaking to a lot of people today. That you're encouraging, you're helping, you're lifting up, you're giving us understanding that our life really is different now. And that you really are as good as the Bible says you are. And that we don't deserve it. 
but you're good to us anyway. Father, we are the outcasts of this world. We have done everything wrong that can be done wrong. And yet, Father, you do not condemn us. We thank you for that, Heavenly Father. Just like the woman caught in the act, you don't condemn us. Help us, dear God, to love you and understand your great love for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Ain't God good?